Portraying itself as a victim of the West, Iran uses the Non-Aligned Movement Summit to garner support for its nuclear activities and bolster its role as a regional power. But how could this gathering be of any help to Iran in the face of increasing international pressure? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Veronica Pedroza. So 120 nations from the non-aligned movement are meeting in Tehran for a two-day summit. On the agenda, the crisis in Syria, human rights and nuclear disarmament. Iran hopes this high-profile event will prove that attempts by the West to punish it economically for its disputed nuclear program have failed. But there's already been discord over Syria when Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi called for, quote, solidarity with struggle against what he called Bashar Assad's oppressive regime. Tehran is, of course, a key backer of the Syrian government. And Morsi's speech prompted the Syrian delegation to walk out in protest. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi handed over the chairmanship of the non-aligned movement to Iran and with it ignited a new controversy over Syria. We express our solidarity with the struggle of the Syrian people against an oppressive regime that has lost legitimacy. This is not only an ethical duty, but also a political and a strategic necessity. Those words didn't please the Syrian delegation. They left their chairs empty and walked out until after Morsi's speech. The Egyptian president's words will not please the Iranians either. They have a close relationship with the Syrian government. Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei also spoke at the meeting and while he didn't address the issue of Syria directly, he did accuse the UN Security Council of being outmoded and controlled by the US, a clear indication of what he thought was Western powers interfering in Syria's affairs. He went on to reiterate Iran's rights to a peaceful nuclear energy program. I repeat that the Islamic Republic of Iran is not developing capabilities for nuclear weapons, but also will not overlook the rights of its people and their need for access to peaceful nuclear energy. Our motto is nuclear energy for all and nuclear weapons is for none. We stand by both of these mottos. And we know that breaking the biased views that some foreign countries hold about the production of nuclear energy and the underlying fundamentals is to the benefit of all nations. And the UN Secretary General was also clear about what's at stake. Now we face the grim risk of long-term civil war, destroying Syria's rich tapestry of communities. Those who provide arms to either either side in Syria are contributing to the misery. Further militarization is not the answer. With Iran now holding the chairmanship of the non-aligned movement, it's likely they'll use the group to further their own interests in Syria. Iran has long maintained that all sides in the Syrian conflict must sit down without precondition. However, the West has said that Iran doesn't have a role to play within ending the Syrian conflict. Now, it's likely that Iran will try and win the backing of the non-aligned movement to try and further its own interests and influence in Syria. Imran Khan, Al Jazeera, Tehran. So how will the Non-Aligned Movement Summit boost Iran's image? For more on this, I'm joined by our three guests from Tehran, Sadegh Zibakalam, political analyst and professor of political science at the University of Tehran. From Dubai, Mustafa Al-Ani, he's director of security and defense at the Gulf Research Center. And from Washington, D.C., Mehdi Khalaji, senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and a scholar of Islamic studies. Welcome to you all, gentlemen. Want to start in Tehran, where the Non-Aligned Movement Summit is actually taking place. We've had the first day. How has the government been pitching this meeting, the importance, the significance of it to Iran's people and to the world, uh, Mr. Z Sadegh Zibakalam. Obviously, Iran is uh, facing a very difficult time as far as uh, its struggle with the United States and the West is concerned. 
So the non-aligned movement, the non-aligned gathering in Tehran was uh, terribly important for the Iranian leaders because they demonstrated to the United States, they demonstrated to the West, they demonstrated to the enemy, enemies of, of Iran that they have not succeeded in isolating Iran and more than, uh, uh, more than 120 uh, um, countries attended the non-aligned uh, movement in Iran as well as uh, UN uh, uh, Secretary and the various other uh, But isn't it just the case uh, that all those heads? nations would have sent representatives anyway as a function of their belonging to the non-aligned movement rather than expressing any, any kind of solidarity with Iran's government in actual fact? You have a point there, but I must add uh, the, the two, uh, two important uh, excursions to your, uh, to your point. Point number one is that uh, you, you, you are quite right. Uh, if, if non-aligned uh, b b gathering had been conducted even on moon, people would have uh, attended. But, but we must bear in mind two important points. Point number one, United States specifically put pressure many countries not to go to Tehran. Point number one. <laughs> point number two, many countries, uh, despite pressure from United States, send their highest delegate. They're, they're saying their head of states, uh, president, kings, prime minister. So I think uh, um, as far as uh, these two points are concerned, Iran can, can justifiably say that uh, I have scored some point against the United States and Israel. All right, well, let me put this to Mustafa Alani in Dubai, because I think that it could also be argued the other way, because Iran, uh, Iran's representatives, Ayatollah Khamenei, President Ahmadinejad, neither of them spoke about Syria. Um, and you had the Syrian delegation walk out, as we heard in that report. So on this first day, despite all the stagecraft, there were very obvious signs of serious splits within the movement. Oh, certainly. First, I, I will question the value of the movement itself. After 50 years of its establishment, what is the movement now? It has no ideology, no policy, no influence on international politics. It is a group, a club of state, which have no, nothing actually, no influence, absolutely no influence over the international politics. The, the, this meeting actually backfired on Iran. Two key speakers in this meeting basically criticize, heavily criticize uh, the Iranian policy. You have uh, uh, the general secretary of the UN criticize Iran on a three front, the question of human rights, the question of uh, the uh, nuclear file, and the question of its relation with Israel. You have Mercy, the, the Mohammed Mercy, the president of Egypt, again the key speaker, attack the uh, Iranian indirectly by attacking the Syrian government. So what the gain here? Basically, Iran become back, the whole meeting was backfired on the Iranian policy. And instead of helping Iran to re basically recover and, and break the isolation, the two speaker uh, pointing out to the, all the uh, fault in the Iranian policy. And th what the, the value of this movement again? I don't see really a value of neither for the movement nor for the meeting itself. To be fair, not only um, is there a split within the non-aligned movement, but what was exhibited was a kind of split within Iranian thinking as well, because you have Ayatollah Khamenei expressing solidarity with the um, people involved in the Arab uprisings over the last year or, or two, but at the same time not saying anything about their continuing solidarity with Assad. They support the Arab Spring, but not in Syria, because Syria is the only ally of, of Iran. And losing the, the, Iranian, uh, the Syrian regime is going to cost Iran strategically a lot in the region. So he, yes, he supports the Arab uprising because he thinks that uh, this has helped to remove a lot of unfriendly government. But at the same time, it's the Arab uh, uh, uprising is now, uh, in, in, uh, the question of Syria is a major issue for Iranian. We have to look at the, policy, uh, the statement before the, 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 what happened since the, the uprising. The Iranian had 100 persons supporting the, the uh, Syrian regime. So I, I think this is here we're talking about double standard in the Iranian policy. But, uh, you know, I don't know what you think, Mehdi Khalaji, in Washington, D.C., and you have a very unique perspective, having been uh, a student of theology in COM and, you know, uh, uh, presenting at the U.S. Congress nowadays, now that you have a different hat as a sort of political expert in uh, Washington there. But 
perhaps there is a use for something like the non-aligned movement in that you have insights into the way that the Iranians are thinking, the way that the delegates are thinking at a time of extreme fragility, really, in the Middle East. There are serious worries about a huge conflagration. What use do you see in what's unfolding in Tehran? Look, for Iranian leaders, uh, the, the uh, image of reality is much more important than the reality itself. And they think that they can uh, create the, the perception of reality for everyone and escape from what uh, reality entails. Uh, uh, let me give you an example. Today, uh, Mr. Morsi, President Morsi, talked in the summit, and when he started to criticize uh, the Syrian government, uh, uh, the interpreter of the conference, which was translating the, his speech for Iranian audience, stopped translating uh, Morsi's criticism of uh, uh, B B Bashar Assad's government and instead said uh, some uh, criticism on Bahrain, which was uh, totally uh, 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 untrue. I mean, Morsi did not say anything about Bahrain. This is how Iranian government think. They think that they can manage the, the perception of the people, the, the public opinion on their policy. And obviously, they are wrong. The, as uh, Mr. Alani said, the, the summit itself well, wait does a minute. not is have... It, isn't that just... A, 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 is it really that cynical? Isn't, is there a, a, a sense in which it, they simply have a different perspective? You're sitting in Washington, D.C. It might well be the sense in Tehran, uh, looking at the allies that they do have uh, in, in the East, that they think they do have important support. Yes, it may not be in Washington or in, on, or in Europe, but look at Europe. It's bankrupt. It's distracted. Look at the U.S. We're going to have a presidential election soon. If there is an economic crisis in Europe or in United States, uh, 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 it doesn't help Iran from solving it, its problem, the, which is mainly uh, its nuclear crisis and uh, uh, Iran's regional policy. Look, what Iran does not want to admit that many of these countries that participated in this summit, they are not non aligned anymore. They have close relationship with the United States. Countries like Saudi, countries like Bahrain, they do not have good relationship with Iran. Uh, even uh, Mr. Morsi, as someone who comes from Muslim Brotherhood, they have lots of theological ideological and political differences with Iran. The fact that many countries participated in this, uh, this summit doesn't mean that Iran can make up its political isolation. Iran has to look for real solution for its problem instead of focusing on propaganda and public diplomacy. All right, I'm sure you've got something to say to uh, come back at those comments in Tehran, Mr. Zibakalam. Yes, I've got plenty to say. I'm sure. First of all, I was, uh, I was uh, watching um, the, the program uh, very tentatively and uh, very seriously uh, because I knew that I would be uh, responding, I would be invited for interviews such as this one. And um, the interpreter uh, might have here and there uh, said, have said something that uh, Morsi didn't say exactly say. But uh, at, on, on no occasion I heard the word Bahrain from um, interpreter. I don't know where Mr. Khalaji got that uh, version that he, he mentioned something on, uh, on Bahrain. Second, we are not talking about uh, Iran's isolation, Iran economic problem, Iran domestic problem. Iran, b b b any kind of other problem. We are talking about a fact called non-aligned movement and the fact that it was held in Iran. Obviously, any third world regime would have uh, made propaganda, would have used the, the occasion um, 
to, to, to show to the world that, well, look, 120 countries have attended, et cetera, et cetera. And the Iranian just did that. Now, whether or not uh, non-aligned movement, going back to what uh, my, uh, my brother Mustafa Alani said, whether or not non-aligned movement uh, has a role to play in, 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 in 21st century or not, uh, that's nothing to do with Iran. Iran has not created an ally movement. Iran is only trying to put some spirit, some life into the non-aligned movement. Iran never said that non-aligned movement is this or is that. And uh, obviously, um, the non-aligned movement has been there uh, many, many years before the Islamic Republic was, uh, was created. I want to turn to you in Dubai, Mustafa Alani, because um, I think we need to look closer at this kind of sectarian cold war stretching from the Gulf countries to uh, Iran, because that is a kind of important subtext to what is going on over there. Um, do you think that this might be an opportunity for further developments um, that might affect impact that competition? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we feel here in the region that we are in defensive uh, position because the Iranians are heavily using the sectarian card here and dividing the country and dividing the society. And for understandable reason, we understand it is that the Iranian policy have interest in, in using the sectarian issue and uh, gaining uh, support inside the, the society and, and the country. But I don't think this sort of meeting going to paper over the crux. Uh, our, uh, our assessment of this meeting is no more than a, a wedding party. Uh, once the music is stopped, everybody go home and forget about it. So it is, it is not really, we are not uh, attaching a lot of importance that this sort of meeting going to solve our problem with Iran or the Iranian policy going to change or the international environment going to change because of this meeting. As I said, the, uh, the NAM movement is, have no value anymore and it has become just a, a, a public relation meeting. All right, uh, before um, we wrap up into our, f our final round of questions, I just want to make the point that despite calls from the United States and Israel to boycott the event, as Mr. Zibakalam pointed out, UN Chief Ban Ki-moon did meet Iran's president and supreme leader in Tehran on Wednesday. Ban called on all the states to stop supplying weapons to all sides in the Syrian conflict, and he expressed concerns about Iran's human rights record. He also urged the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to take concrete steps to prove Iran's nuclear work as peaceful, saying, quote, Iran needs to take concrete steps to address the concerns of the International Atomic Energy Agency and prove to the world its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes. Now, I want to turn to you, Mehdi Khalaji, because your think tank that you work for has spoken about the nuclear fatwa of Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Can you talk a little bit about that in connection with what Ban has said today? Look, uh, Islamic Republic is neither Islamic nor Republic. Uh, we know why it's not uh, Republic, because uh, uh, they don't uh, uh, recognize the democratic mechanism for a change of power in Iran. But the reason is not Islamic, because Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of Islamic Republic, has uh, brought up and developed a notion which is the, no, uh, the uh, uh, concept of maslaha or the interest of regime. Uh, his uh, theory is basically this. In any conflict between Islamic law and the interest of regime, interest of regime uh, uh, would uh, uh, trump Islamic law. Uh, and this has a, a long precedent in Islamic Republic. So the decision making in Islamic Republic is not based on Islamic law or Sharia, but it is based on uh, the interest of regime uh, in a way which is perceived by Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader. So Ayatollah Khamenei, no matter what he think, about the religiosity of the nuclear program or nuclear bomb. If Iran needs to develop a nuclear bomb, they would not go to Sharia. They can find the justification in the notion of maslaha or the interest of the regime. All right. Um 
it does seem as if the nuclear program is a kind of elephant in the room that nobody talks about, um, Sadeg Ziba Kalam. Uh, to Day when we're talking about uh, the non-aligned movement uh, representatives um, and how they are trying to balance relations with Iran and um, the West and the United Nations as well. Um, can you see how all these elements um, are, can work together to pave a future for Iran's foreign policy in the next few months, which are going to be so crucial with what's going on in Syria? Well, uh, there are two uh, important issues. Uh, one is uh, the question of Syria, uh, as far as uh, the non-aligned uh, speeches in, in Tehran were concerned. And the second issue is the is the nuclear issue. Let me touch upon the, uh, the, the, the second one very quickly. Ayatollah Khamenei, the Iranian supreme leader, has stated categorically and precisely that building an atomic weapon, an atomic bomb, is against the Islamic principles. He has been so clear, so concise on that, that if he goes back on that word, and if it be announced one day, six months time, six years time, that Iran has secretly has developed uh, an atomic uh, weapon, it would not be only a discredit of the supreme leader to the world, but it would be to, to his followers. He has some followers in Iran, and they would, they, would, they would turn back to him and tell him that, well, look, you told us time and again that making an atomic weapon is against the Islamic principle. I I really don't know what uh, Mr. Khalaji is, uh, is saying. I can understand Maslaha, but how can you convince uh, millions of Iranians that you've told them, Ayatollah, specifically and categorically, that Iran is not Iran is not going to make an atomic weapon, and you have built it. You have no uh, justification for it. As far as Syria is concerned, Syria is a very complicated issue. First of all, Iran has a strategic ties uh, with the uh, with Syrian regime. Syria was the only country, was the only Arab state, which backed Iran in the war against, um, against Iraq. Syria has been the bridge uh, um, through which Iran has been helping uh, Palestinian uh, in, in, in Gaza and West Bank, um, and uh, as well as uh, helping and maintaining support for Hezbollah in Lebanon. Obviously, Iran doesn't want to see the collapse of, of, of this regime mm. because Iran, uh, if, if you like, Iran is holding that, that uh, the Syria as a, as a bridge to support right. and to maintain so they... pressure on Israel. So, Professor Sadiq Zibar yes. I'm sorry, we're running out of time, and I do want to t get uh, a view from the other guests before we go. Mustafa Alani, it does look like there is an existential dilemma for the so-called axis of resistance that uh, Mr. Zibar Kalam was just talking about, Hezbollah, Syria, um, Iran, uh, in you know, and we have the tension with the West over the nuclear program going on as well, increased talk in Israel, about a possible preemptive strike, so they say. Um, it does look very dangerous. Isn't it important to have meetings like the non alive movement so that at least, you know, there is some talk about these issues? What, what the talk now? I mean, uh, there is no real serious pressure on Iran, uh, apart from the uh, uh, speech uh, made by the, the, general, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the UN. Uh, the, uh, the nuclear issue is not a major issue. Apart from the Egyptian president, the Syrian issue is not an issue. It is basically, this is a, me a meeting which is without objective, without policy. It is a social gathering, no more than that. So we are not expecting anything more than uh, anything serious out of this meeting. But the question of the triangular uh, relation between Iran, Hezbollah, and Syria. Yes, we're witnessing now a major shift in the, in the strategic balance in the region. The fall of the uh, Syrian regime going to undermine the Iranian power in, in, in the whole region. And this is what, what welcome uh, development for our for, uh, country in the Gulf and possibly in the rest of the Arab world. So we, basically it is what, what, what we we're seeing now. Iran is panicking because after losing Gaddafi, uh, which is uh, uh, an, another ally of, of, of Iran during Iraq-Iran war, now they are on the verge of losing Syria. So they try to use this right. meeting 
but basically to uh, but, but I, I think they are, they, there is no success in that absolutely not all right I'm sorry but we have run out of time we could actually continue this discussion this discussion of course for many more minutes but I appreciate the insights that you've given us so far thank you very much in Tehran Sadek Zibakalam from Dubai Mustafa Alani and from Washington DC Mehdi Khalaji and thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story if you want to send us your feedback do just email your thoughts to us at Inside Story at aljazeera.net. I'm Veronica Pedroza. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.